happy to be together to study. And we're on um, heading toward the end of our uh, three months in the epistles in here. I know not everybody's been in here for all three months, obviously, but um, I'm, I'm glad to be heading toward the end, at least. <laughs> and uh, it's, it's been a, a great uh, sort of teaching adventure, I'll put it that way. But we're in uh, looking at, supposed to be looking at chapters 14 through 19. We're a little bit behind. I'm going to really start out in chapter 12 and get a quick run up to uh, what we'll be trying to cover. I don't know that we'll get through 19, but if we can get through 18, we'll be doing really well um, this morning. So buckle your seatbelts and look, open your Bibles and uh, think with me as we talk about uh, Revelation. In chapter 12, you have really the beginning of what I call the second act. If you think about Revelation divided into two big sections, and this, this second part uses different metaphors and symbols to tell pretty much the same story as the first part. Good bit more detail, sign of a heavenly perspective in, in chapters uh, 12 through the end of the book. But we're introduced to a woman and a dragon here, and the woman represents the people of God. She's pregnant. She brings the Messiah into the world. The devil stands ready to devour him as soon as he comes into the world, but he's caught up uh, to be with God in heaven. This child is, again, the Messiah. And uh, we, we looked at the symbolism of that. Uh, when that occurs, then a war breaks out in heaven. Michael and the angels of heaven uh, fight with the, the devil and his angels. Uh, and Satan and his forces are cast down to the earth. Uh, by virtue of uh, this victory, salvation, strength, and the kingdom of God, the power of Christ have come. So this is the establishment of the kingdom of Christ. This is what we're looking at in symbolic terms from a heavenly perspective. Uh, and, and the victory of God's people is empowered, as the text says, by the blood of the Lamb, the word of his testimony, and they love not their lives to the death, their willing, willingness of the followers to give their lives for this great cause. Um, what was pronounced, though, on the inhabitants of the earth, because now the devil has come down. His power is limited in the he heavenly realm, but it's certainly at full force in the, in the world. Uh, so his, his, the devil has come down, he has great wrath, and he's going to try to harm not just the people of the earth, wicked people, but everybody, and particularly the people of God. And so he pursues uh, the woman. He, he has great wrath, he seeks to persecute the woman. Uh, she's given wings so that she can fly into the wilderness, which is to say uh, she, she is not caused initially at least to confront the devil head on. She's able to escape uh, a lot of what he is attempting to do. Uh, the woman's given help. She flies into the wilderness. She's protected for a times, time and a half time. Again, that's the three and a half or 12, 1,260 days, the 42 months. It's half of seven. Uh, and it suggests to us a, a view into something that's whole, but it's just the centerpiece of it, so to speak. Um, the, the dragon then, um, the serpent, spews out water out of his mouth to cause the woman to be carried away uh, in the flood, but the earth swallows up the flood. We're now in chapter 12, verses 15 and 16. The serpent spewed water out of his mouth a flood, uh, uh, like a flood after the woman. He might cause her to be carried away in the flood, but the earth helped the woman, and the earth opened its mouth and swallowed up the flood which the dragon had spewed out of its mouth. So if you think about literally what this is describing, the first great persecution of the church was from the Jews. But it was not successful because, of all things, Rome would not allow it. If you think about what stopped, uh, what stopped the Jews from just wiping out Christians in Jerusalem to begin with, well, you had a Roman governor. What, what caused the Jews not to be able to kill Paul? Well, he appealed to Caesar. Uh, on and on and on. Uh, every place Paul goes, you know, you have... Well, they wind up sometimes before Roman tribunals, uh, and he appeals you know, to his Roman citizenship and things like that. So uh, through Jewish persecution, uh, that was the first persecution of the church, but it was not very successful uh, because uh, of basically being helped uh, by the world, so to speak. So now the, the dragon is really mad uh, and totally enraged, and he goes off to make war with the woman and her offspring. That's the end of chapter 12. That brings us then uh, to chapter 13. And this is, again, the, the story flows uh, pretty easily right here. What's Satan going to do next? 
Well, what he does is he raises up two great beasts to uh, attack the woman, uh, to attack God's people. Uh, John says, I stood on the land and the sea, and I saw a great beast riding up, rising up out of the sea, having seven heads, ten horns, and on his horns ten crowns, on his heads blas a blasphemous name. <clears throat> the beast which I saw was like a leopard, his feet were like the feet of a bear, his mouth like the mouth of a lion, and the dragon gave him his power, his throne, and great authority. So the devil, unable to destroy the woman with his first attempts, uh, is now bringing up these beasts. The sea beast is the first that is going to be described, and there'll be a land beast or a beast out of the earth. Um, these two will represent the Roman Empire, which Satan co-ops to his purposes to persecute Christians, and false religion in the Roman Empire, which is aligned with, uh, obviously, the Caesars and actually encourages people to worship the Caesars, but it empowers empowers the Roman Empire, gives them a reason, a motivation to persecute Christians. Their false religion does. So these are aligned together, the empire and its false religion. Uh, and you see it then being described. This sea beast, as we just read, he rises out of the sea, and that's human society, something that comes out from human society. Uh, he has these ten horns, which that horn is always power, ten, associated with human effort. Seven heads, uh, which will talk about somewhat later, ten crowns, blasphemous names, so he's against all that is good. Uh, his parts are like ferocious animals, bear, leopard, lion, those symbols come out of visions in Daniel as well. Um, his power comes from the dragon, so he's animated and empowered by the dragon, and he certainly represents the Roman Empire. Uh, in Daniel chapter 7, we can't go back there now and look at all of that, but uh, I think a look at that would pretty much assure anybody that we're looking at the Roman Empire here. It's described in the same way in Daniel's vision uh, and certainly the fourth empire of Daniel's visions uh, in which the kingdom of Christ was to be established. All of that uh, from the book of Daniel. So all the world, it says, adores the beast and is held under his sway. Um, Verse 4 of chapter 13, they worship the dragon who gave authority to the beast. They worship the beast, saying, who is like the beast? Who is able to make war with him? He was given a mouth, speaking great things and blasphemies. He was given authority to continue for 42 months. He opened his mouth in blasphemies against God, to blaspheme his name, his tabernacle, those who dwell in heaven. It was granted him to make war with the saints and overcome them. And authority was given him over every tribe, tongue, and nation. All who dwell on the earth will worship him, whose names have not written in the book of, of life of the Lamb slain from the foundation of the world. If anyone has an ear to hear, let him hear. So uh, this is this horrible creature that um, seems like it's so big, so powerful, so evil, that it's just going to wipe out Christianity. And if you look at that description, he can even overcome the saints, which he begins to do in the latter part of the first century. Um, but in verse 10, we have a verse of hope. Uh, it says, He who leads into captivity shall go into captivity. He who kills with a sword must be killed with a sword. Here is the patience and the faith of the saints. So the saints are going to have to endure this, but with patience and faith, this will pass. The one who leads into captivity is going to go into captivity. He who kills with a sword is going to be killed with a sword. This empire will be taken down. Uh, and so that's a bit of assurance right in the midst of a pretty horrible description of what's about to happen to the saints and what was happening. Um, then you have the, the land beast or the beast out of the earth. He rises up. Uh, interesting description of him. He has two horns like a lamb, but he speaks like a dragon. Uh, so he's talking dragon talk. Um, so like somebody to be worshipped, uh, like our lamb, and yet his, his words are evil. He causes those on the earth to worship the sea beast. I think probably most all of us are aware of how uh, widespread Caesar worship was in the first and second centuries. Uh, people were compelled to worship Caesar. There's all kinds of evidence of this. In the seven churches of Asia, it was prominent. I don't, wasn't here when you went over the seven churches, but there were temples to Caesar in almost all of the seven churches that we actually can have pictures of today. Uh, it, was a, it was a big thing in these seven churches to whom this, this letter was written. 
So they're facing that. They understand about uh, being compelled to worship the beast and the problems with that. This, uh, the land beast is later called false prophet in chapter 16 and chapter 19 and chapter 20. So later on when we read that term, the false prophet, it's false religion associated with the Roman Empire. Um, so he compels people to receive a mark on their hand or their forehead in order to buy or sell. In other words, if you want to participate in, in the, the economy of the Roman Empire, you're going to have to give your allegiance to the Caesar. And this was required in a number of cities where you had to come into the uh, imperial cult temple and burn a pinch of incense and say Caesar is Lord once a year in order to maintain your status in, in the trade guilds or whatever it was. Uh, so you couldn't really participate wholly in their economy if you weren't willing to uh, announce Caesar's Lord. So the number of this beast is 666. Six is you know, one short of the seven, so it's, and three is the number of deity. So to me, that just says imperfect deity uh, or you know, that which uh, is, is God, but it's not God. Um, that, and by the way, that's, again, that's symbolic. Nobody's actually receiving a, a literal mark on anything, okay? Just like when the saints were sealed in, Revela in Revelation 7, you know, that didn't mean they walked around with the seal on their forehead, literally. It's symbolic. They're identified with. They're identified as, um, you know, aligned with the Roman Empire. So some important lessons from this section, and I know I'm now half a section behind, but this is where we should have ended last time. Uh, God has not revealed to man all of his plans. We saw that the seven thunders were sealed up, you remember, in chapter 10. Uh, God determines the dimensions of our relationship with him, measuring the temple. He measures the temple, the worshipers, the altar. It's all measured. He decides what those dimensions are. God uh, will ensure that his word is established on the earth. Nobody could stop. Nobody could stop the, the two witnesses from establishing his word on the earth. They could not be stopped. Uh, and even when they were killed, uh, it was not going to end. Satan seeks to destroy God's people, God's plans, but the forces of heaven are too powerful for him by far. Satan empowers great forces of this world to harm God's people. He did it then. Yeah, I think he still does it now. We just don't get a revelation about it every time it happens. Um, we can overcome through God's word, the blood of the lamb, and the willingness to sacrifice our lives, just like they did. So uh, those are some really powerful lessons um, give us a, that help us with our, our world view, I think, our, our, our view of what this world it really is and what's going on even today. helps me a lot. All right, so... That brings us to chapter 14. You might think, after seeing these two beasts, then, uh, oh, this is the end of the world for Christianity and all that sort of thing. But it's almost like uh, in heaven, it's ho-hum. You know, it's like <laughs> this is, Satan's doing his worst. And what you have, John says, I looked and behold a lamb standing on Mount Zion, and with him 144,000 having his father's name written on their foreheads. Who were these? They're the ones in chapter 7 who were sealed with his father's name. They're on the earth. Here they're in Mount Zion. Are they troubled by all of this? Are they uh, about to faint and give up? I heard a voice from heaven, like the voice of many waters, like the voice of loud thunder, this powerful voice. I heard the sound of harpists playing their harps. In heaven there's rejoicing. They sang, as it were, a new song before the throne, before the four living creatures, the elders. No one could learn that song except the 144,000 who were redeemed from the earth. These are the ones who are not defiled with women, for they are virgins. These are the ones who follow the Lamb wherever He goes. They were redeemed from among men, being first fruits to God and to the Lamb. In their mouth was found no deceit. They were without fault before the throne of God. So here are people who have been redeemed by God. They've been purified. They've been sanctified. They're willing to follow the Lamb in their lives, whatever happens. And they're, you know, heaven's rejoicing. They're rejoicing. They're glad to be Christians. In the first century and the second century, it is... Uh, a fact that, you know, Christians were thrown to the lions and when the lions were attacking them, they were singing hymns. It's just, it's how they live their lives. Uh, it, you know, th this was not going to d deter them uh, from their commitment to serve the Lord and their desire to go to heaven. So these people are, are again, they're described in figurative terms, virgins referring to purity and all of that sort of thing. Um, when, once we see that, then 
we have a, a bit of a, a preview, like we're reading the program, and you ever watching a play, you know, and you say, okay, I see what's going on here. What's happening next? And so you read the, <laughs> the next uh, little bit that's described in your program, what's going to happen in the next act or, or scene or something like that. And so you have a bit of that right here. Uh, you, you have three angels come and, and uh, proclaim, first of all, that judgment has come. People need to repent and fear God. You know, th this is the thing that the devil is doing. It, it may look like the devil is going to win. The devil is not going to win. Judgment has come. It's almost like when in, in these movies where the bad guy has the good guy by the throat and he says, you know, I'm going to destroy you, and the good guy kind of laughs in his face. No, you're not. <laughs> you know, that's, that's about where this is. It looks like Satan's got Christianity by the throat, but no, he doesn't. Uh, and the warning of the angels is judgment's coming. Repent. Secondly, Babylon has fallen. Now, we haven't really been introduced to Babylon yet. Uh, we will see Babylon described in chapter 17, maybe even today if we get there. Uh, but that's going to represent the city of Rome. Uh, think about Babylon of old in the Old Testament, the great city of a huge empire that, that um, attacked the people of God, destroyed the temple, took people of God captive, so it's a perfect symbol of what Rome was. Babylon and Rome, I mean, they stand almost uh, parallel in human history as far as what they try to do to God's people. Uh, so the third message of the angels is anyone in league with the beast is going to be made to drink of the wine of God's wrath. And this also gives us a little bit of a preview about what's going to happen because the wine of God's wrath is going to be pressed out and then it's going to be poured back on the ones who produced it, which is the earth. You see that in verses 9 through 11. Um, an angel said, If anyone worships the beast and his image and receives his mark on his forehead or on his hand, he himself shall also drink of the wine of the wrath of God, which is poured out full strength into, into the cup of his indignation. He shall be tormented with fire and brimstone in the presence of the holy angels and in the presence of the Lamb, and the smoke of their torment ascends forever and ever. They have no rest day or night who worship the beast and his image and whoever receives the mark of his name. So judgment is coming. God's wrath will be vented. It's going to come straight out of what these evil people have produced. Let me take a breath. Does somebody have a question or not understanding where we're going or anything about this? Okay. Um, those who patiently endure and faithfully keep God's commands are going to be uh, blessed eternally. That's for sure. Um, you see that at the, at the end of this section. Here's the patience of the saints, verse 12. Here are those who keep the commands of God and the faith of Jesus. Heard a voice from heaven saying, Blessed are the dead who die in the Lord from now on. Yes, says the Spirit, that they may rest from their labors, for their works do follow them. At the end of this chapter, there is the, the reaping of the earth. So the earth has produced all sorts of bad fruit. Just picture, you know, all these grapes have been produced and they're all bad. Uh, the dwelling of evil people. And so you, two things happen. First of all, it, it looks like there's a double harvest of this, but let me just quickly go through this. Verse 14, I looked and behold a white cloud, one on the cloud uh, like the Son of Man, having a, his head a golden crown and his hand a sharp sickle. So this, I believe, would represent Christ, and he's going to do some reaping here. Uh, he has the sickle in his hand that you reap with. Another angel came out of the temple. Here is um, a critical thing. The temple would be the dwelling place of God, right? This angel comes out of the temple, cries with a loud voice to him who sits on the cloud, thrust in your sickle, reap, for the time has come for you to reap, for the harvest of the earth is ripe. So he, set, he who sat on the cloud thrust in his sickle on the earth, and the earth was reaped. Everybody follow that? Secondly, verse 17, then another angel came out of the temple, which is in heaven, he also having a sharp sickle, and another angel came from the altar. What altar? Altar that's before the throne of God where the services and the prayers of the saints are coming into his presence. Our prayers, our service, our sacrifices, right before the throne of God. Remember that? All of that's being elevated to him. Another angel came out of the altar, came out from the altar, who had power over fire, and cried with a loud voice to him who had the sharp sickle, saying, Thrust in your sharp sickle and gather the clusters of the vine of the earth, for her grapes are fully ripe. This looks like uh, deja vu all over again. But really what's happening is, it's one harvest, I believe, but 
the will of God in the temple is united with the will of the saints, what they've been praying from the altar. And I think that's the concept. Here is what's coming up to God request-wise. Here's what His will is anyway. So when the will of His people is united with His will concerning His justice and His wrath, that's going to happen. Okay, And it's going to happen double, so to speak. Um, so the angel thrust in his, his uh, sickle and the earth was reaped uh, and all those grapes thrown into the winepress of the wrath of God. So here in this picture, if you can make it out, you see uh, a wine press there where all these grapes are thrown in and they're pressed out. There's so many of them that the text tells us um, the wine press was trampled outside the city. The blood came up to, uh, out of the wine press up to the horse's bridles for 1,600 furlongs. Uh, 1,600, four times four times 1,000. Four is always the number of the earth and 1,000 is always big. It's a lot of it. So that's the kind of a number that is. Numbers in Revelation are always symbolic. So that's... So here you have a a picture of that. It's pretty cool. This represents uh, really the amount of evil, if you will, that had been produced by the people of the earth. So what's going to happen with that is uh, it's going to be collected up in heaven and poured back out on them. You're going to, in other words, you're going to get what you produce. You're going to, you're going to reap <laughs> what you have sown. Uh, what you produce. So John now sees another sign in chapter 15, and it's the seven angels with the seven last plagues. Um, in them, the wrath of God will be complete. Before he shows us that, or has shown that, uh, there's a sea of glass mingled with fire. Those who have the victory over the beast, over the image of the mark of his, and his over his, his mark and the number of his name, standing on the sea of glass, having harps of God, they sing the song of Moses, the servant of God, and the song of the Lamb, saying, Great and marvelous are your works, Lord God Almighty. Just and true are your ways, O King of the saints. Who shall not fear you, O Lord, and glorify your name? For you alone are holy. For all the nations shall come and worship before you, for your judgments have been manifested. So they see God judging the wicked people that are hurting his people, and they praise him for his justice. The song of Moses and the Lamb uh, songs of victory and of uh, praise to God for his justice. Now John looks and he sees the temple of heaven open. And out of the temple, seven angels having the seven last plagues. And they're clothed with pure bright linen, having chest girded with gold bands. Have we seen that before? A chest girded with gold band? In the depiction of Christ among the lampstands in chapter 1. So they're, they're dressed in garb similar to that of Christ. It's a heavenly garb, if you will. Um, and it says, one of the four living creatures, remember who they are? It's four living creatures before the throne. One of the four living creatures gave to the seven angels seven golden bowls full of the wrath of God who lives forever and ever. The temple was filled with smoke from the glory of God and from his power. No one was able to enter the temple till the seven plagues of the seven angels were completed. You might remember uh, when Solomon dedicated the temple, the smoke being filled, the smoke filling the temple with his glory so that they could not even continue uh, the services. Uh, here you have a uh, symbolically in heaven itself uh, that occurs. So the temple is filled with the smoke from his glory and his power and his will is about to be done on the earth. That then brings us to nobody's surprise to the seven bowls of wrath. Because the creature has given them to the angels. What do we expect next? Again, it's a flowing story. These bowls of wrath will be dumped on the earth. Um, this all, again, uh, connected together, I think, pretty seamlessly. So you take the, the seven bowls of wrath and... Uh, the angels are ordered in verse 1 of chapter 16 to go and pour out the bowls of wrath uh, on the earth. So here they go. The first bowl poured on the earth and a sore came upon those who had the mark of the beast. The second bowl is poured on the sea 
and the sea becomes blood. The third bowl is poured on the rivers, and they become blood. In verses uh, 5 and 6, God is praised because you've judged these things, it says. In verse 6, they shed the blood of saints and prophets, and you've given them blood to drink. That sounds like justice to me, right? And so God is praised for his justice. They have, they have produced these fruits, and now they're going to reap the fruit, fruits that they pr- produce. They get blood to drink for what they produce. The fourth bowl is poured on the sun, and men are scorched. The sun is going to represent uh, a world power. Uh, the fifth bowl is poured on the throne of the beast, and it becomes dark. The throne of the beast becomes dark. The sixth bowl is poured on the river Euphrates, and we talked about this a little bit already. The Euphrates dries up, and the way of the kings of the east has now opened up for them to invade the Roman Empire. That's the concept. So the armies now will be free to come and fight. Uh, it's dried up to prepare the way of the kings of the east. They gather for the battle. Th- that is the battle of Armageddon that we hear so much about. But this is the only place in the Bible where it's mentioned. But we're going to talk about that. Uh, I think most of you know this, but I think it's important when you're teaching this to have a good firm grasp of Armageddon. Armageddon means Mount Megiddo. It's Hebrew for Mount Megiddo. Okay? This is a picture of Megiddo in the map where it's located uh, at the head of the Jezreel Valley in Israel. Uh, it's a um, place from Bible history. A number of great battles occurred here. Uh, King Josiah was killed here by Pharaoh Necho, you might remember. Uh, Barak and Deborah, their war fair occurred right in this area. In fact, Megiddo was mentioned in, in that text as well in Judges. So there are other uh, events here that occur where you have God's people and the forces of some foreign evil power you know, clashing. This is a place where that happened frequently. Um, and the thing about Megiddo is all, all, all roads lead to Armageddon. Literally, all roads lead to Armageddon. If you're coming down uh, in, in, from, from the north, from, uh, from the east, say you're coming from where Iran and Iraq are, if you're going to come and attack uh, you know, God's people in Israel, you're going to have to come down this highway. It says to Mesopotamia up there to the right. If you're coming from uh, Italy or Greece, you're going to have to come down this highway where Tyre and Sidon are. These are ancient roads. I say highways. These have been here for thousands of years. Same roads. From, if you're coming up from Egypt, you're going to have to come up this, this road. It's the only way you can come, the coastal highway, uh, the Via Maris, it's called, um, Way of the Sea. Uh, so literally, all these ancient roads wind up at Armageddon. And so here's a picture I took in 2016. I am sitting in a bus, and that's Mount Megiddo right there. That's Armageddon that I'm taking that picture of. And look at all these cars. This is in the middle of nowhere. I mean, there's not a city around here. There's nothing. And all these cars are coming together because all of these roads come together at this place, wherever you're coming from. All right? Um, So uh, here's a picture of it from the air Farrell Farrell took uh, about 10 years ago. And I texted him. I said, Farrell, am I correct that Megiddo site depicted in the photograph is essentially the extent of Mount Megiddo, Armageddon, in Revelation 16, 16? And he said yes. So that's nice. Those who don't know, uh, Brother Jenkins was head of the Bible department at Florida College for decades and a a renowned uh, Bible scholar in um, in archaeology as well. Uh, So what that leads us to is the seventh bowl. We're going to talk about the Battle of Armageddon, by the way, when we get to chapter 19. You'll see it fought and won uh, and it's explained. It's not called Armageddon, but you can see that's what's happening. A lot of this unfolds in detail in the, few, in the next few chapters. In any way, uh, seven bowls of wrath, as we look at uh, the seventh bowl, completes the bowls of wrath and God's judgment on the enemies of his people. Um, it's, as somebody says, it's big doings um, in verse 17. The seventh angel poured out his bowl of wrath into the air. A loud voice came out of the temple of heaven from the throne saying, It is done. There were noises, thunderings, lightnings. There was a great earthquake, such a mighty earthquake as has not occurred since men were on the earth. The great city was divided into three parts. 
the cities of the nations, and great Babylon was remembered before God to give her the cup of the wine of the fierceness of his wrath. Every island fled away, and the mountains were not found. Again, all of that is going to represent uh, peoples and nations and all of that. Great hail fell from, fell from, uh, uh, great hail fell from heaven, fell upon men. Each hailstone weighed, weighed about a talent. That's heavy. Uh, men blasphemed God because of the plague of the hail, since their plague with pain was exceeding great. So again, we see when we come to the seventh trumpet, much like the, the seventh seal, uh, you're given this big crashing God's judgment finalized, but you're not given very much detail. It's in, it's in global terms instead of, well, what's exactly happening here? That's going to be explained in the next few chapters. We're going to go through step by step and look at more what's happening. So these are the bowls of wrath. We're to picture them, which I think is a good thing to do, by the way, as I've said. You can start with the, on the clockwise going around, the, the, the sores coming up on people who had the mark of the beast, and then the uh, ocean turning to blood, and the waters turning to blood, and the, sor- uh, the sun scorching people, and the throne of the beast darkened, and the, the frogs uh, deceiving, or opening up the three deceiving spirits, opening up the way of uh, the armies at the river Euphrates, and then the big crashing uh, <coughs> judgment at the end with the big hail and all of that. The seven trumpets and the seven uh, bowls are parallel. Uh, they touch on the same things. The only difference is that the seven trumpets are partial. God tries to get people's attention. You remember in th- that there was not a full punishment. It was a third of this and a third of that. Now, this is the full. That's what it says it multiple times. In, in, in the seven bowls, his wrath is complete. It's full. Okay? And, and so the difference is between what God might have done to Rome at the beginning to try to get people to repent and what he did at the end as final judgment when he brings them down uh, completely. Okay? And that brings us to chapter 17 where we're going to look at Babylon. And we only have a few minutes, but I think we can at least um, understand a little bit about who Babylon is now. One of the seven angels in chapter 17 and verse 1 who had the seven bowls of wrath came and talked to me and said, Come and I will show you the judgment of the great harlot who sits on many waters, with whom the kings of the earth have committed fornication, and the inhabitants of the earth were made drunk with the wine of her fornication. So he carried me in the way in the spirit, away in the spirit to the wilderness, and I saw a woman sitting on a scarlet beast, which was full of names of blasphemy, having seven heads and ten horns. The woman was arrayed in purple and scarlet, and adorned with gold and precious stones and pearls, having in her hand a golden cup full of abominations and filthiness of her fornication. And on her forehead a name was written, Mystery, Babylon the Great, the mother of harlots, and the abominations of the earth. I saw the woman drunk with the blood of the saints, with the blood of the martyrs of Jesus. When I saw her, I marveled with great amazement. So this woman's going to be identified in, and some of her evil is going to be described in this chapter. And then in chapter 18, she's going to be destroyed. Uh, so we understand this to be the destruction of Rome, the city of So here's what we're looking at. Who's this woman? Well, she sits upon many waters, human societies. Uh, The kings of the earth have consorted with her in harlotry. She is called, in fact, a great harlot. Her clothing suggests royalty. It's purple, uh, all of that, and wealth. Her forehead is labeled Babylon. That's key. She's a city like Babylon. Uh, And she is drunk with the blood of the saints, a city where many saints are martyred. Um, and she's supported by the beast, but also controlling it. She's riding it, right? So who is that? What is that? Well, that's a great city that reigns over the kings of the earth. I didn't read that in chapter 17, verse 18, at the end of this. She's a great city that reigns over the kings of the earth. So in my mind, there is no doubt that she is the city of Rome. Some of my brethren want to make her the city of Jerusalem, and I find virtually no merit for that whatsoever. But they have reasons for it. I'm not going to get into their reasons, but um, I think it's got to be the city of Rome for, for lots of reasons. And we'll see some more in just a sec. Uh, so uh, the scarlet beast then is described in the next few verses, and I'm not going to read those, but 
you might read them and I'll point out some things as you go. Uh, there are many similarities between this beast and the one we saw in Revelation 13. Uh, it was probably obvious as you, as you read it. It's coming up out of the sea, has the same uh, heads and crowns and all of that. So the seven heads uh, are explained for us what the seven heads uh, represent. Um, let me look at that. Uh, verse 9. Here is the mind which has wisdom. The seven heads are seven mountains on which the woman sits. They're all, they are also seven kings. Five have fallen. One is and the other has not yet come. When he comes, he must continue a short time. So this, this beast, which is motivated and empowered by Satan, uh, I think is the same one we saw in Revelation 13, just with a little bit of history. Rome, the city of Rome, is famously known for sitting on seven hills. Even if you tour there today, they might tell you that in a tour. Uh, the, the, the heads also represent kings, and five have already been, one's fallen, one's to come. Um, the ten horns are ten kings to come up to rule briefly with the beast. That's explained. Again, we saw those same ten horns in uh, the vision in Revelation 13. They make war with the lamb, but the lamb overcomes them. But eventually they turn on the harlot and make her desolate and burn her with fire. You might know in the destruction of uh, the city of Rome that it was vassal nations uh, in part that turned against her that uh, caused her ultimate demise and, and fall from world power. Uh, okay, that's where we're going to stop. That's perfect. <laughs> You said, well, it didn't, it didn't seem perfect, Steve. <laughs> Anybody have a thought or a question? <laughs> well, I have, an extra, I have an extra class. That's what I'm banking on. <laughs>